All right, welcome back to Computer Science E75. This is Lecture 5, a sequel. Uh, for those of you playing along at home, there was no Lecture 4. We had a snow day last week, but this week we will catch ourselves up. Uh, project 1 is soon due. Next week we'll go out Project 2, which will integrate the types of stuff that we'll be talking about this evening. Um, what I've been doing over time is anytime I see something funny or stupid, I tend to take a screenshot of it because it lends itself to demonstration and lecture. And so very recently, I found two uh, germane examples on two websites, the first of which is this link here. Um, so recall that we actually showed this, I think, a while ago, or an example like this, whereby if you zoom in on the top of this page, what was remarkable or noteworthy about how Domino's implements their online ordering site, apparently? Unsecure. OK, so this particular page doesn't use SSL, it seems. So that's perhaps worthy of note, especially if I'm being uh, asked to provide some sensitive information. What else was noteworthy? And I think this came up only in week in lecture zero, but we promised to revisit. So how do you know we're, so we're using, well, how do you know that? In, OK, indeed. So there appear to be parameters in the URL. So that does indeed suggest that I got to this page by way of get. What else is noteworthy? <laughs> OK, so terrible URL. What's terrible about it? Yeah, so this is kind of an interesting thing. So it appears that Domino's is implemented in Java using what's called uh, Java server pages, JSP, or perhaps underneath the hood, Java servlets. And I know that because of the file extension. Login.jsp suggests that it's Java-based. But you notice after that, there is, in fact, this long parameter called jSessionID. And this is the equivalent, in this context, of PHP session ID. And what do we mean by session ID in the context of PHP? What, is that more technically? Yeah, so it's the cookie. It's a value of a cookie that's pseudo-randomly generated, and it's really big and long. It's pretty much as ugly as this thing, but we've seen that it's generally sent behind the scenes by way of the HTTP headers. So Domino's, um, for better or for worse, has decided, at least for this page, to communicate the session ID by way of the URL. Why might that, or when might that be justified? Yeah, so if we did pr propose, I think, a couple weeks ago that if someone has disabled cookies, one of the mechanisms that certain web servers and certain um, language uh, uh, architectures like PHP will try to do is send the session ID by way of the get string instead of trying to send it uh, by way of the HTTP headers as cookies because if, the browser, if it detects that the browser is simply ignoring those headers, well, then it's going to try this as a last-ditch effort. Even the Extension School's website for some time, I forget the language with which they've implemented uh, that particular version, but it too was often having J session IDs appear in the URL, and I know this only because I would sometimes copy and paste URLs from the courses ca uh, from the school's catalog online, and just because I was a bit anal, I would always manually have to delete the session ID, partly just so that the student wouldn't get confused by some really long URL or something that wraps and just breaks for no particular reason. So I did not have cookies disabled in this case. So it's curious that Domino's site nonetheless put this up there, but some sites simply do. Case in point, again, the extension school for some time was doing this. Yeah. What about the semicolon? So yes, we seem to have a different delimiter here of a semicolon. Um, it's not clear from the URL alone what web server software they're using. But recall that we have seen, or at least I've discussed on the bulletin board somewhat recently, how you can use tricks with, say, mod rewrite and such to actually parse URLs in a different way. So that's one reason or one explanation for how they might still be getting that piece of information out there. And perhaps I would hypothesize, because I'm not wholly familiar with how the back end of the server is doing this J session ID, it might also be there to help the server realize this is not, in fact, an HTTP parameter. It's something different. So let me parse this separately so that it's not confused for a user provided parameter. But just a hypothesis there. There's one last thing that we can point to. And we promise to come back to it later in the course when we talk about scalability. Yeah, they seem to have hard coded into the redirection that got me to this page, www.28.order.dominoes.com. So I'm going to infer, correctly or incorrectly, that they have at least 28 web servers, which actually feels like a lot, but maybe not, maybe not. Um, they appear, though, to have directed me to a very specific one, which means that if I 
walk away for a few minutes and then come back and want to finish my order, or I copy and paste, maybe not this particular page, but maybe some other page within the site, it seems to be at risk of leading me to a dead end if www28 goes offline or goes out of service altogether. So we'll talk later in the semester about how you can still create the illusion of just one destination, www.orders.dominoes.com, while behind the scenes, unbeknownst to the user, you can still load balance your traffic over any number of actual servers. So this is sort of a poor man's approach to load balancing or just a stupid design decision. It's, it's perhaps unclear. So this was more of a fun bug that I came up with. And I was, in fact, at the time ordering a pizza and was getting upsold by the following. What is remarkable from a programmer's perspective about this? This was very GoDaddy style. I wanted to check out with my thin crust pizza. And it was, <laughs> would you like some chicken as well? Yeah, it's kind of a nice sprintf error or something along those lines. Right? They haven't used a format string that requires two uh, decimal points of precision after the price. So it's actually still this way. I kind of got a, a taste for the buffalo chicken kickers and have since ordered them again. And the bug is still there. So I'll be curious to see just how long it takes for that to go away. So one other um, interesting excerpt I saw this week, which isn't necessarily a bug, but just feels like the programmer or programmers could have done better was when I was signing up for this online wallstreetjournal.com account. And I scrolled down here. And there's a lot of text here, but this page is ultimately oh, looks a little, it, uh, all, I remember what it says, because I apparently didn't take a high enough shot of this. So it says, name the print publication to which you subscribe, and then you choose an option. Then it says, enter your account number. And then in parentheses, do not enter spaces, hyphens, or, or slashes. And anytime, frankly, I see things like this, it's just stupid. Like, this is such an easy thing for you to fix server side when the user types in a number with hyphens or other punctuation. If they type in a phone number, there's really no reason you have to force them to delimit the fields when you can figure it out, assuming it's, say, a 10 digit US telephone number. So, this is sort of the thing that in a class, you know, I think this is sort of point worthy deduction because there's just no reason to put this burden on the user or to just add this gratuitous line of text because you can imagine now in PHP using a little uh, preg replace function or preg match, the Perl, re uh, the Perl regular expression functions, you can strip out any such punctuation that you don't want. So sort of a weak attempt with that one line of code would have actually fixed. So um, those are this particular week's excerpts. So any questions about things we've seen thus far? Or anything else course related? No? OK, so just a word on evaluation of projects. What you will find is that we very intentionally, because there's so much uh, design discretion that's encouraged by the specs, is that we tried to grade projects as objectively as possible, but also by putting uh, submissions into as few buckets as possible so that we're not quibbling over, for instance, what's a 95% versus a 94%. And so you'll find ultimately that your code and projects, when submitted, are evaluated along three axes. Not so much project zero, which really was just a set of check boxes to check off, not so much design discretion there, but at least for project one, two, and three, you'll know the three, you'll notice see here that the three axes will generally be correctness, design, and style. So you'll see, you've seen probably on page one or two of project one's PDF that we spell out what we mean by each of these categories. And well, you'll notice when you receive your projects back, if you haven't already, that we've been placed into one of these numeric categories. And to be clear, lest you worry that a three is sort of the equivalent of a C. A three is good for the first actual project of the course. The hope is that they'll be upward trending. And odds are there's nothing, there's no submission among you or even among code that we write that doesn't have some room for improvement. So one of our goals as teachers in this course is honestly just to push you toward writing even better code. So if you're ending up this first project with a three, that is in fact good. If you're ending the course with project three with poor or fair, sort of the wrong trend that we're looking for. But um, realize that there's meant to be room for improvement. But because so much more time is generally spent on getting things correct, and we all know that less time tends to be spent on things like commenting and these kinds of things, notice the weights on the left-hand side here that more weight will generally be given to correctness and then a little more to design. And that's not to say that we don't want comments and well-named variables and such, but we appreciate with these metrics, hopefully, how much relative amount of time is going into these different aspects. So any questions, please feel free to ask your assigned teaching fellow or me directly. 
So I thought it would be a fun uh, segue into actual code tonight to resurrect this example that just so happened to be the lolcat of the day a couple of weeks ago. So this is from this very popular website called uh, ICanHasCheeseburger.com. And I will admit on camera that very recently they just opened lolmart.com, which is their e-commerce site. One or two of you have seen this site, um, for better or for worse. But have one or two of you actually bought Happy Cat from the site for 1997? So I now have a Happy Cat on my desk in the office. And it's a pretty good rendition of uh, Happy Cat for those completely unfamiliar. Not that this will enrich your life particularly. But if you Google Happy Cat, uh, this is the true happy cat that you can now buy in plush form. <laughs> so they did a pretty good job in, uh, in uh, creating him out of plush, plushness. So I mentioned two weeks ago that just for fun, but also for pedagogical purposes, did we integrate lolcats of the day into my undergraduate course's website, partly just for fun, but partly to illustrate the point that with the right language and the right server setup, it's very easy to do interesting things with very few lines of code. So what we included tonight among tonight's code excerpts, if you flip a couple of page in, you'll see that in the lolcat directory, there's lolcat.php. And I'll pull it up here. But just to show you how we actually went about doing this, it really didn't take much effort at all once we knew where the actual data was. So first, let me go ahead and pull up uh, I can has cheeseburger. Let's just pull it up this way. So I pointed out two weeks ago that if you come to this site, uh, all right, let's get out of the way, everyone reading the current one on the website. OK, that's not bad. It's on the plus and minuses sometimes. But what's really the takeaway here is that big RSS icon. So we talked about RSS and XML in general the past couple of weeks. And what this led me to was a page that uh, looked like this. And then I was a little confused because apparently, just to make things a little more user friendly, the WordPress architecture that they're using or the site that they've implemented gives you a whole bunch of ways to interface with the XML that's presumably somewhat customized for these various engines or adds them automatically to your various new uh, RSS readers like Google Reader and such. But what I wanted to do was just see the raw feed XML. I don't really want to know about anything that's website specific. So I clicked this link. And in just a moment, let's see if it's going to let me do this. Yeah, it's a little ugly in, um, in the browser form here. But notice some familiar uh, features. So at the top left, there's your open bracket RSS. And if you just kind of skim for random things, it looks, actually, this is not what I actually want. There's too much feed burner stuff in here. Let me go to, let's try this with Firefox, I think. This one's being a little too friendly. Oh, I see what they're doing. OK, so they're hosting their XML file elsewhere. OK, so now I'm viewing it with Firefox. And Firefox 2 is rendering the XML, the RSS, in a manner that it thinks is more visually interesting rather than showing me the raw XML. But if I cross my fingers, uh, there we go. Cross my fingers, it's still kind of a mess. And the only amount of time that it really took to get this code up and working was frankly just figuring out what the structure of this file was, because there was a lot of stuff. So I think what at the time I might have copied and pasted this into an XML type editor and then clicked the pretty print button, which just nicely indented everything and made my life a little easier. But there we have in the top left again the RSS icon. Over to the right, you'll see the channel uh, element, rather, the title element. So hopefully, if you remember that canonical slide we had two weeks ago, that should be reminiscent of a typical RSS feed. So there's an RSS element, there's a uh, channel element, and then there are zero or more item elements. So it turns out that the way they are syndicating their lolcat feed is they have all of the captions and the dates that they're posted and then links to the actual file. So Firefox isn't rendering these images for me, but notice that in these gray boxes it is actually giving me direct links to what appear to be the JPEGs that get embedded. And I'm not going to linger too long lest it get entirely too distracting. But it appears to be the case that they're in all right, that's that's funny. <laughs> 
they appear to be embedding, per the top of this browser, the actual URL. So that was my goal. I wanted to grab this XML feed, somehow parse the XML, and then extract, ultimately, the title or the caption of this thing so I could embed it on the website, the URL of this image so that I could embed the actual image in the website. So again, the context here was, in this particular course's website at bottom right, we always had this little thumbnail. And then if you click that thumbnail, it brings you to an actual page. Well, what I did for tonight's purposes was recreate that actual page. So if I go now to our uh, lecture 5 code, uh, which is in your hands in printed form, and I now go to, let's see, lecture 5 <laughs> source code and go into lolcat. And you have two different versions here. The PHP S files, recall, are browser readable. The other ones are executable. This is all the code we're about to look at. But this is the effect it creates. So it's very simple. I simply spit out a page dynamically that contains the actual, a little slow today, caption, and then the image embedded. So very little XHTML. So how do we do that? Well, let's take a quick look. So here is. <laughs> I got to close that, otherwise I'm going to smile every time I alt tab. So here's the actual code. So um, scrolling down, and I didn't, uh, because my font is relatively big, it kind of wraps in an ugly fashion, but let's take a look. So I have some XHTML that's just going to spit out a template page for me. Then I decided to put lolcat of the day with an h1 tag, and now here's my PHP code. So the very first thing I did, as you've probably been doing already for project one, is I'm instantiating a simple XML element. I'm passing it a string that contains what? Yeah, so the actual XML file. So I'm using file get contents, which looks conveniently not only at your local disk or if passed a URL, it will go out on the internet and grab the contents of that URL. It returns them as a string recall. So I'm passing to the constructor simple XML element a string representing that XML. And now conceptually, what is being returned by this constructor? So it's a tree, essentially. Now, more properly, it's a simple XML object, which has some PHP-specific properties to it. But conceptually, it's returning a DOM, the uh, in-memory representation of that tree that allows me to do this by way of arrow notation, uh, traversing of that tree from root down to children. So the first thing I decided to do was grab a particular item. And now I'm getting the XML feeds channel elements zeroth item. So you can actually index into uh, the set of children that are returned by a particular node. And why do you think I'm going after the zeroth item here? Yeah, I just want the latest. And I hypothesized and empirical tests confirm that the very first item in the file is in fact the most recently added uh, lolcat to the feed. So that works. It's a bit of a leap of faith because I am going to run into a bit of a bug here if what is the case? Right, so if it's empty. So if something goes wrong, you might actually get an error on this page because I'm trying to access an array element that doesn't exist. But this was sort of an acceptable uh, price for me to pay for simplicity here. What do I appear to be doing with this third line of code with preg match? What's that trying to match exactly? It's doing something with the description. What's going on? Well, let me alt tab back to, what's that? Let me go, uh, I can, uh, uh, oh, was I, let's say, oh, disappeared. OK, I can, uh, let's go back here. Oh. I'll count to the day. OK, let's grab this. Come on. OK, there we go. So why, why did I do this? Oh, there we go. Description. Yes. So if you take a look here, notice that we are current, even though this is slightly out of context because the screen is so big, right now we're in the description element of an item. Now if I zoom in on this particular excerpt, notice what the website has sort of arbitrarily or stylistically decided they would do inside of the every description element. They say lol cats and funny pictures of cats hyphen I can has cheeseburger the home of lol cats and lol and actually I'm not uh, we're in the wrong description. 
There we go. Sorry, wrong description. Roll back the tape about 20 seconds. So now I, I was inside the description element for the channel element a moment ago. So now I'm inside an actual item. And I realized through some trial and error that every description, for whatever reason, starts with this identical string. Law cats, kittens, and funny pictures, space, hyphen, space. And then the actual thing I cared about, which was the caption in the actual description. And just because I wanted a little challenge, just for aesthetic reasons, I only wanted to embed in the page or in the alt attribute, as we'll see, of the image, the caption. I didn't want that sort of buzz, uh, uh, the catchphrase that they had before it. And so this preg match line is very simply saying, expect the description to have some text, so dot star, followed by a space, followed by a hyphen, followed by a space, followed by some more text, dot star. But what's the role then of the parentheses around this second dot star here? Yeah, so this is capturing whatever string is actually matched there. So this is a very powerful thing of regular expressions, if you're not familiar. We, in, the past, uh, in a past lecture, used regular expressions to validate something like an email address. But you can use regular expressions to extract substrings that match some pattern. The pattern I'm simply trying to match here is something hyphen something. And the fact that I put parens around this second something, so to speak, means that what's going to happen, thanks to this function, is this variable here, which I arbitrarily but conveniently called matches, it's going to be populated as an array containing all of the matches that this regular expression returns. So by that I mean the first match inside there is going to be whatever was in effectively parentheses. In other words, I will extract everything after the hyphen with this line of code. It's a very simple use of a regular expression. And notice that this recall means start matching from the start of the description. And what is this here for? This open bracket forward slash. Exactly. So at the end of the description element is open bracket slash description close bracket. So I wanted everything after the hyphen and a space, but up until the closing of this tag. And so that got the job done. All right, so what did I then do with that? All right, so I create a variable called alt. Uh, I'm using HTML special chars for some reason. More on that in a moment. But I'm passing in this variable, this matched, and then I'm using this constant here. So it turns out that one, well, why, why do you think I'm using this function called HTML special chars? And I'll explain it as follows. What this function does is it takes a string, and characters like uh, the ampersand are quote unquote escaped. It's turned into ampersand AMP semicolon. Uh, if you have a special quote symbol there too, it's also changed to ampersand QUOT, semicolon, and so forth. Why is this useful? Um, if you read the same special text Exactly. If I really want to be anal here and sort of ward off browser confusion, the goal, as I alluded to a moment ago, is to ultimately spit out a tag like this, where alt equals quote unquote whatever the image is caption is. The problem is if the caption has a semicolon, or rather a, a single quote, or a double quote, or even ampersands, all of those might lead to errors of well formedness, which means the browser just might spit out some garbage results, or the page certainly is not going to validate if there's some kind of confusion along those lines. So HTML special chars, if you look it up in the manual, just converts anything that's potentially dangerous like that to the equivalent XHTML entity. And this constant here simply says, make sure you do it for quotation marks as well because I know in advance that I'm particularly worried about quote marks screwing things up. Uh, good question. It is, in fact, a zero-based array. This matches array. But at location zero, by convention, is the original string that you just tried to match. So the whole string, which we previously called item description, is copied into matches bracket zero. And generally, I don't even use that variable because I had access to it somewhere else. But it's in matches one, two, three, dot, 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 where your actual parentheses-based matches would go. And since we only have one set of parentheses, we only look at matches bracket one. Now, there's apparently, recall in the RSS feed, a link. So I'm just grabbing that uh, item hyphen, uh, arrow link. And now I'm doing this. So this is the only piece of the puzzle that took me a few minutes to figure out. Because if we look closely at the RSS, you'll notice that this particular RSS feed uses what are called XML namespaces. So long story short, XML has this feature whereby you can put different nodes in different namespaces. The problem is with PHP's simple XML API, 
by default, if you're iterating over the children of a node, you only get back nodes in what's called the default namespace, which means if there is some other element that looks like, let me see if I can grab a quick snippet to demonstrate, XML NS, uh, XML NS, and what, let's see, I want the content. So notice this, it's these content elements that ultimately contain the URLs with those JPEG uh, paths. But notice that inside of here is XML, so there's the content tag, but it's inside of, it's, it's got this media colon thing going on. And that relates to this topic known as XML namespaces. And so long story short, and we won't spend too much time on this here, but just know that it exists so that if you do trip over this issue, at least know what uh, road to go down. Notice that I have to do this special thing. To get at the children in a particular namespace, I actually have to tell the PHP parser what namespace, is, uh, what, the ch what namespace you want children from. And I literally copied and pasted that uh, URL that appears to be in the Yahoo namespace in order to get at the content elements that I want. So if this is a little over here now, that's fine. But just realize there is this feature of XML that we didn't really talk about last uh, two weeks ago. It's known as XML namespaces. And it does introduce a bit of trickery when it comes time to grabbing no, uh, nodes from different namespaces. When you have anything foo colon, uh, think namespaces. Now what am I doing ultimately? I just wanted to get out the attributes of the content, specifically the URL. And again, I'm going to wave my hands at the particulars here just so that we can focus on the end result. The end result is quite simply to spit out this XHTML, an anchor that's linking to this link, which came from the RSS feed, an image inside of that, which just has this alternative text for screen readers and whatnot, uh, a border of zero so that I don't get an ugly purple border or whatnot around the image because it's a link, and then finally the value of the source attribute. And so the net result is to, in fact, create this relatively simple page that qu quite simply has our lolcat of the day. And it's kind of a lie. It's not lolcat of the day. Uh, a lot of people spend a lot of time making lolcats every day. So it tends to change every couple hours. But the point is nonetheless the same. So any questions on this use of PHP, this use of XML, or some of the challenges that arose as a result? Yeah. OK. So I thought when you use a simple XML element, it's, you know, here it's in the process of parsing it, it strips all these you know, syntax elements, you know, from, you know, XML syntax elements from the uh, streams. Uh, so where, how does that angular bracket wind up being in the uh, Python description? That's a good question. This might be a bug. Yes, you are right. It's a convenient bug that we don't encounter because the pattern matching stops literally one ca uh, uh, character before my mistake. So the match works up until, no, that's not true. Hang on. Uh, description, description, low cast weight. No, I am correct. Aha, OK. <laughs> OK, so it's not a mistake. Because if it were a mistake, the whole string would not match anything because of the presence there, which means we'd get no matches whatsoever. What's happening is that in because of the way ICANHasCheeseburger.com designed their RSS feed, what is going on is inside of the description, for instance, is this thing here. So I'm still inside of the description. Notice they have used the equivalent of PHP's HTML special charge because just because they wanted to embed inside of their description elements actual HTML code, HTML code that would create for them an image tag so that an RSS reader would try to embed this actual tag in the screen and therefore show the image inline. So this is kind of an abuse. You're, this is not really the way you're supposed to embed X HTML or XHTML content in an RSS feed. In fact, we did mention briefly the right way of doing that. That's to use what feature of XML? C data. So the right way to embed a tag like this, which we'll actually see a little later tonight, is to have encased this tag not by escaping it with the less than entity, but instead to actually leave it alone as open bracket, but instead to do uh, this 
cryptic looking thing, which took me about two years to remember in the end. But that is, in fact, the pattern. So that would have been the proper way to embed data inside the RSS feed that you want to be sent to the program receiving this string, but you don't actually want it interpreted as actual XML uh, meta characters, like the, open, the actual open bracket. OK, excellent uh, gotcha to point out. Yeah? It is greedy. So it would match the first one, and then everything else would get dumped into what's being matched within parentheses. Oh, so I said it the opposite there. Right, so it would match the very first hyphen, because I'm starting from the start of the string. Oh, I see what you're saying. Oh, so I could have been even more anal here, because this could contain that. So what, hmm, interesting. I'd have to actually think this through. All right, so if it's really pick on me tonight. Um, <laughs> technically, I was, tr in the interest of simplicity, I maybe wrote potentially buggy code. Dot literally means anything, which means it could include a hyphen there. So technically, what I should have said is match any character except a hyphen, because I actually, oh, can I redeem myself here? But I know what that string actually is, right? Because it's always that lol cats dot 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 and funny pictures hyphen. So I know that there's never a hyphen there. So this just tends to work because any additional hyphens would end up in this particular pattern match. So the, but a better way to have done this would have been actually to embed the literal string, lol cats comma whatever it is and funny pictures hyphen, just because I know what the string is in advance. Or I could have more precisely said, give me any character except a hyphen star. And the syntax for this as a little bit of trivia, or just to answer this question thoroughly, is to have said not dot star, but a character class with the caret symbol inside of it, which means not. Then I would say, um, uh, what's the character? Not hyphen. And even the hyphen has to be escaped, because otherwise it implies a sequence from like A to Z. So now the regular expression looks like this. And I mean, frankly, I probably didn't want to even get into that when I wrote the, slot, when I wrote the code. But that would be even more proper, more anal way of capturing this precisely. So another good thing to trip over that if they started throwing more hyphens at me or if they changed the text in the description, yeah, the code would break. But trade off between how much time I wanted to spend up front and how much time I'm willing to spend if and when it does break. It's kind of a cop out. <laughs> other questions? Well, actually, no more questions. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Okay, so now let's take things up a notch and start to persist our data. So project one does involve a database of sorts. That's a bit of a generous term, though, because you're only pulling from an XML file, but you're not actually expected by projects one spec to write anything out. So the order is placed, an email is sent, and that's kind of it. So you're using the internet as your database, or someone's inbox as your database, effectively. But there's no read-write access. There's nothing being stored locally. And that was intentional. But in project two, when we implement an E-Trade-like website, CS75 Finance, will you actually need to persist your data, because you're going to need to empower users to register, to log in, to log out, to actually buy stocks, sell stocks, um, and actually um, interact with live data and make purchases, quote unquote, that are actually retained, even when the user is long gone, but might come back a week later. So for that, ultimately, we're going to be using a database, but it's not necessarily the, on the only approach. So we, tonight, will introduce SQL, Structured Query Language, and specifically MySQL, which is a very popular database engine that's freely available. It's very highly performing, and it's pretty easy to just get up and running. But it's often overkill, or it's not possible because you don't have the access necessary to actually install and get a database server up and running. It typically requires root access, for instance, on a Linux box. So you do have alternatives. And we're going to actually use these various file formats for different projects. CSV we will use in project two, because Yahoo Finance, you'll see, allows you to download stock data in near real time in CSV format, sort of Microsoft Excel format, but it's just comma separated variables, a simple text file with different fields like company name, comma, company symbol, comma, current stock price, new line, repeat for another company. So it's a very simple file format to parse, which makes it wonderfully useful for exchanging information in a non-proprietary way. You could, in theory, use CSV to write out your own persistent data. So for instance, in project one, when someone places an order, 
you could, for instance, store that data in a local text file so that the user can come back and the next time they order, you can say, oh, here's your order from last time. Do you want to reorder this? Domino's kind of does that. Or you can allow them to sort of save their cart a la Amazon and come back to it later. Because you can't store it in the session if you want to achieve that goal. Why? Right, so the session will eventually go away. It might time out because of some server-side timeout value. The user might close their browser, which means that session cookie, that big, long, random number, is just completely forgotten. So you need to store it on disk. Of course, you're going to now need to remember a username and password or something like that. But you could certainly imagine using CSV files, even for usernames and passwords. A very simple format in which to store usernames and passwords might be username, comma, password, new line. Username, comma, password, new line. And frankly, this is kind of what the world still uses on many Unix systems. Etsy password or Etsy shadow is pretty much equivalent. They use colons instead of commas, but it's the same idea. It's some special symbol separating values. So an alternative to that is certainly XML. And why might you prefer XML over CSV data? So it's kind of easier to query, right? You have nice APIs, a la the simple XML API, the XPath language, that just make it easier to get at data because it can uh, leverage hints, metadata, tags, and such in the file to get at data. Whereas with CSV, who's the burden on? Yeah, it's kind of more on you. You have to remember what the zeroth field means, or the zeroth column, the first column, the second column. Now, you can imagine, if probably seen in Microsoft Excel, that usually people will use the first row of the file to give a name to the uh, actual column. So you could infer it from the file, but there's still more work to be done. You have to sort of implement that functionality yourself, whereas XML, it's kind of right there. So you can write out XML literally just by printing open tags and closed tags. You could create a DOM in memory using the simple well, XML API, and it actually has a function called asXML, which if you take a simple XML object called the asXML function, it will just return to you a really big string of XML. So some of you have been having troubles trying to tuck away a whole XML DOM inside of your session object. That's generally, uh, it's a complicated enough data structure that it doesn't necessarily serialize well automatically. But if you called asXML, you could in theory tuck it away in the session. But if it's just your menu, then you really don't need to store the menu, for instance, in every user's session. Because remember, how is the session implemented on disk? Damn. <laughs> how is the session implemented? <laughs> That's right. It's implemented on disk. So even though you have this illusion of the variables automatically being handed to you in this dollar sign underscore session variable, the only way those things are kept around, especially when the user might take minutes to click that next page, is they're being tucked away in a special file in usually slash temp. Um, so if, just as sort of a warning to those of you who've um, asked about this on the bulletin board, if you're serializing or if you're tucking your menu into your session, you probably don't need to. There's other things that are compelling to put in the session, but you don't want redundant comp copies. You don't need redundant copies of the menu floating around. But XML would be an alternative, certainly for storing. It's not going to be any more efficient than just rereading it. Exactly. In fact, now you're just making superfluous copies of it, one for each user. Right, exactly. Right? You're literally copying it and using up more bytes. Now, you could use XML to store a data structure effectively, the equivalent of an item in your session. But even then, you have the ability in PHP to model objects with classes, for instance, or even simple arrays. And those kinds of things do tend to uh, be serializable. That is, they can be stored in a session very easily. So, yeah? So rereading the menu.xml is preferred in this case? In this case, yes. Rereading the menu on every interaction with the user is preferable only because PHP does not offer you any kind of application-wide shared memory. So you're going to have to reread the data structure into memory for every transaction. And if you're putting it in the session, even though it feels like or seems like it's being tucked away somewhere nice and RAM, it's not. It's being sort of behind the scenes, written to disk, reread from disk. And so now you just have multiple copies of the original data. So you don't gain anything by putting it in the session, unless you are actually massaging the data in some way or stripping away tags that you don't actually need. And you're storing, for efficiency purposes, less data. But even then, you're now doing that for every user, which doesn't feel quite right. So let's take a look at this example. And let me motivate this with the following. I'm going to skip ahead just so I can grab a URL here. In a real world meets E75 uh, example, 
um, for the computer science faculty lunches every Friday. Um, they used to just order a big smorgasbord of sandwiches and everyone would sort of choose their preferred sandwich of the day and then the grad students, of which I was once one, uh, would just get the leftovers, frankly. So it, it sort of worked very nicely. There was a nice trickle-down effect. Though in these, these difficult times, we now do ordering sandwiches on demand so that we only order as many sandwiches as there will be humans during the day. And up until a week ago, the mechanism via which we would do this is someone within the department would send her out an email uh, with the URL to Rebecca's Cafe menu, say email me back with what you would like this week and we'll place the order on behalf of everyone. So very low hanging fruit here, right? This is a perfect opportunity to improve that workflow so that humans can do a lot less work, particularly the person receiving this information. And so I, only because I had nothing else to do at 10 p.m. one night and didn't end up sleeping the next day since you know how projects tend to grow uh, unexpectedly, I decided to implement this menu in a manner consistent with the types of lessons, frankly, we were preaching in project one. It's sort of a pizza ML meets Rebecca's cafe, right? So here's the menu. All the names of the things they have are in bold. There's little descriptions. The prices are all the same for different categories. So the first thing I sat down to do was figure out how to model this data using XML. And I ultimately came up with a uh, reasonable but still subjective approach whose details we don't really need to uh, focus on but I realized that on the left hand side of the menu this actually was the big headache I did everything like specialty sandwiches specialty wraps salads and I'm like damn it they also have a make your own sandwich option which I couldn't really remove that from the application just because it was more work because there were certainly people who would like to make their own sandwiches but this is sort of like programmers nightmare right like you have a very nice menu choose one of these options and now you have to let the user like interact even more uh, dynamically with the site um, so you have like 10 different types of cheese, eight types of bread, different fillings, and you have to be able to add any number of combinations here. Now I'm sure you couldn't check all of these boxes because you're not going to get a sandwich with the works from every single category for $7.95. But so there was sort of a design line I drew. Like I'm not going to start figuring out what their algorithm is for accepting or rejecting a sandwich. We'll let a human do that. But I did need to somehow model that information as well. And so I came up with a fillings element which had different fillings elements, breads element, whose children were bread elements, cheese, condiments, spreads, and then the other things were a little more straightforward. I saw there were like four or so categories, specialty sandwiches, specialty wraps, and uh, they each have a name. And then notice there's something that jumps out at you, sort of a reiteration of this particular point. Why might I have done this in closing all of my descriptions with C data? And I didn't even bother to be clear with description elements, right? This is such a simple menu. There's an item. I put its name in quotes as an attribute because we're, really, we're not going to be extending the names of these uh, uh, sandwiches at any point. And then I just tucked as the child of an item element the description because I don't need yet more metadata. And frankly, it was already getting tedious enough creating this thing. So why might I have done some C data here, do you think? OK, so ampersands, potentially, if there was something like that. Though an ampersand's pretty easy to redress. I could have just done something like um, embed ampersand AMP semicolon. That would be pretty quick. Uh, new line was not the motivation. It's a reasonable hypothesis if there were some certain text that I wanted to actually maintain. Uh, The commas and the spacing. OK, so another good hypothesis, if I wanted to maintain white space and all of the um, uh, quote marks, but still no. There's no difference in putting it in C data here versus in actual um, as a raw child element. You know what I'm trying? Oh, there it is. OK, it was this stupid, stupid corner case. Right? And I'm very anal, so if I figured if one element's going to have C data, they're all going to have C data. So like halfway through the project, I realized that the menu emphasized with your choice of dressing, right? and this is maybe really being anal to really draw attention to this, but they had bold-faced it in Rebecca's Cafe's menu. And this is precisely the kind of thing that if, it's not, if your attention's not drawn to it, the person who ultimately has to place the order is going to have to reply to the faculty member saying, what type of dressing do you want? At which point, I'm going to look like an idiot, because this was a problem that could have been solved by the guy who wrote the program. And so this, too, I felt sort of obliged to fix. And the reason that I embedded it in, with 
in C data ultimately was because just like our discussion of the lolcats embedded image tag, I wanted to preserve this XHTML content and have it spit out to the browser. I didn't want it to appear as ampersand LT semicolon and such, and I didn't want to have to use like pattern matching to convert those things back. So in short, this is actually a very reasonable use for C data when you know there's invalid or non-well-formed markup that you nonetheless want to preserve for some reason. Flanking it in an open C data and closed C data tag is precisely the right way or a good way to encase that data. And I'll admit that it really was overkill putting everything in C data, but I figured at some point, if I'm sort of assuming that the child is a C data section, I don't want to have to special case some elements. So I'll just make them all C data. So this does beg the question, how do you go about getting some arbitrary data set like this, which looks to be fairly well structured, into an XML file? Grep. What's that? Grep. OK, so I could write a script that sort of uh, searches through this for various features that I could extract. How else? Yeah? Yeah, so it would be nice, though I, I fear whenever you see sort of a site like this, odds are it's not the nicest thing. So it doesn't, uh, so it's HTML4. I can tell from the doc type declaration up top. But the point here is that if it were well-formed XHTML, and frankly, this is one of the reasons that we preach sort of adhering to standards like this. It just makes programmers' lives ultimately so much better. And frankly, it makes browsers parsing so much more reliable. But if this is HTML, I mean, I can't use the simple XML API because it's not going to return a DOM because there might, in fact, be ambiguities in the file. Like a BR tag might not be closed, an HR tag might not be closed, attributes might not be quoted and so forth. JavaScript might not be in the C data sections. So there's a whole bunch of things that could go wrong. Odds are they do have some kind of pattern. But I'll spoil the punchline. Sometimes in life it takes less time to copy and paste than it does to write a program that would actually parse the page and get it into a file. So this was all done by hand. And unfortunately, I too, unlike you, I did not have the liberty of saying, you can now choose one of three sandwiches from each of the categories, because those are the three I chose to implement. But let's actually now tie this together with some code. So rather than dive right into this one, which could very quickly become a fairly arduous task, let me pull up this form here. So among our examples tonight, let me go back to our lectures page and pull up what's in the development subdirectory here. We have in the lunch directory, development, and I have this file called lunch.php. So here's what I decided to do. I didn't want to implement the whole thing. So I'm I did put that whole menu into an XML file. But for class purposes, we certainly don't need to have 100 different options. So I just chose one category, which looks like the specialty sandwich category. So I'm somehow uh, using that XML file, but I wanted to keep it very simple. I wanted some radio buttons, I wanted some person's name, and then I wanted them to submit the order. But I want to, and here's the lesson for tonight, or the first, we wanted to persist this data. We didn't want it to just send an email to say the person who's going to be placing the order, if only because that's really a headache, right? You could filter them into a folder, but what if someone changes their order, now you've got two emails, and it just, it'd be nice if we could just tuck this into a database so that on Thursday afternoon, when it's time to order these sandwiches for Friday's lunch, there's just one big list. Copy, paste it, fax it to the company, you're done. And so that was the goal. And the first approach I took here was to just use a CSV file. So skimming the code reveals not much magic at all. This is all the code it took. It's a little ugly looking, but it's not many lines to spit out that particular web page. So what did I actually do? I took the sort of old school approach of using a table to lay things out a bit invisibly, just because it would make it uh, reliably pretty. And notice that here, I'm iterating over what elements specifically? Yeah. So all of the specialty sandwiches, because I'm going from the root element called menu, the category called what? So this is a predicate here. So at name means the attribute of which must be specialty sandwiches. And now notice it is wrapping. But if you scroll further, what's the final element type that I'm grabbing? Item. So I'm in fact iterating over all of the item elements that are inside of the category with that particular name. All right, so what am I then doing? I'm spitting out for each of those things an input element. I'm spitting out an ID for some reason. I'm then spitting out the name, which appears to be uh, I. Uh, uh -huh. Oh, yep. So I'm spitting out uh, the name of this radio button, which is going to be item, because I want exclusivity. So they all have to have the same name. But they are going to have different value. The value of this first radio button is going to be whatever the name is of this current item. 
And then below that, I have this use of label. So incidentally, this is a sort of useful and accessible, friendly feature to point out. Have you ever visited a website where you cannot click on the text, but you have to literally sort of use precision and click on the radio button? It's mildly annoying, but that's the default behavior. So if you've never seen it, one useful, simple, mindless trick tonight that you can take away is by using the HTML label tag, you can allow the user to click anywhere on the actual text that corresponds to that radio button, and it allows you to select the radio button much more useful. So it's wonderfully useful, and that's the reason I had this ID attribute, because, and very simple explanation, if you have an, uh, an input element with an ID, you can then have a label element with a for attribute whose value is identical to that ID. And that says anything in between open label and closed label can be clickable. And clicking on that text will result in that radio button being checked. So very useful, very nice, uh, a nicety adding to your code. But that's pretty much it. Then there's a submit button up top. There's a field up top for the person's name. But that's actually it. But to what file does this form ultimately submit? Yeah, so in the first version, it's submitting to a file called csv.php. So let's take a look at what that's doing. So in csv.php, there's not all that much going on. Ultimately, this is what I'm going to print. What's this going to say? So one something for someone coming right up. So let me actually mimic this. I'm going to go ahead and order the California Grilled Chicken Club. I will be David. I'm going to submit my order. And one California chicken club for David coming right up. But that data has hopefully been recorded somewhere. And let's fast forward to the end here. Uh, it's called, let's see, what's the file? Called orders.csv. Whoops. What's wrong? Orders.csv. Uh huh. Orders.csv. That's a problem. Orders.csv. Yeah, no, I know. That's, that's, that's hence my puzzlement. Um, <laughs> orders.csv, right? Put CSV. Uh, am I on the right? Oh, <laughs> yes, I'm using Malin's account, but I am using viewing CS75's code. So let's do this. Thank you. That probably would have taken me several minutes to realize. All right, launch, development, and voila, there they are. All right, so there are my two orders. Wrong account, that's all. OK, so I appear to be saving the data here. And notice the use of quotation marks, which is probably there to hedge against what risk? Yeah, so if there's a lunch item that has a comma in it, bad things happen. But the convention is to actually surround things by quote, quotes, which should avoid that. So let's take a look at csv.php. The end result is just to print out this very simple page. But notice at the top of this file, there's actually some logic going on in PHP. So the very first thing I'm doing is ensuring that the complete form was submitted. So here's a little sanity check, error checking. So if the name was not provided or the item was not provided, redirect the user back from wherever they came. So back to that particular URL. Um, otherwise, open the CSV file for appending. So if you've not seen this before, this is a wonderfully useful trick to know in PHP and sort of illustrates the goal here. You use F open like you would in some other older languages. Um, quote unquote A means append. So I don't want to write to the file and therefore clobbering it with whatever previous orders were there. I want to append to it. So a, quote unquote A does that. And I also had the foresight in this example to use file locking. So there's kind of a problem here, and we'll come back to this next week, this notion of a race condition, whereby if two people at separate computers are both trying to place an order at the same time, and they say literally click submit at the same time, and those packets representing their orders literally get to the web server at the same time, it's not clear whose order is actually going to get written to the file first. And bad things can happen if one thread is trying to write to the file while the other thread is trying to write to the file. You can get like literally commingled data, characters sort of out of whack, or one order might just not get recorded at all, depending on the particular lines of code you're using. But if you instead first say, lock this file, assuming your operating system supports this particular feature, that will keep the other thread, the other user, out of that file until you're done appending. Then he'll go through and actually append his. So this is one of those very subtle bugs that, frankly, 
it's unlikely that within the same narrow number of milliseconds, two faculty members are both going to try to place an order, but it is possible. And again, I look kind of stupid being the computer science instructor if I can't make a website that actually records orders reliably. So this is sort of a requisite feature. And at least on our server, it's as simple as this. You take the file handle that was returned, you use this particular constant, and if the operating system supports it, you will get a lock on the file that you'd better ultimately release. Otherwise, no one's going to write to this file again. Now, down here, I'm creating an array called order. That array is going to have two fields, the person's name and the item in question. And here's a wonderfully useful feature of PHP. I don't have to think about the quoting of strings that might have commas in them. I don't have to think about how many fields this particular CSV file is going to have. I can literally pass this function, fput CSV, the file handle, and an arbitrary array, and it will dump that array out as a row into that file. When I then called fclose, that has the effect of closing the file and releasing the lock, and voila, we have our own flat file database purely in CSV format. And you'll see ultimately in a, a week or two, there's also an analog fgetCSV, which wonderfully will literally take a Yahoo data feed in CSV format and return to you all those things, company name, company symbol, company price, and actually just hand it to you in the form of an array in the completely reversed process. Yeah. Ah, an excellent question. So let's say David J. Malin, we'll even add two white spaces there. Let's submit order. All right, so it seems to work on the H XHTML side. If I now open orders.csv, the function's smart enough to realize, oh, there's some white space in here too, feels a little dangerous. Let's just quote this string now as well. But for efficiency purpose, it appears that the implementation, if it's just a string with normal characters, it doesn't bother wasting the bytes. And, out, and uh, exchange, oh, sorry, uh, Microsoft Excel and such programs are generally smart enough to realize when the quotes should be there and when they need not be there. So they won't appear, for instance, in Excel. Yeah? Embedded quotes, does it handle that? Yep, embedded quotes would be handled as well with escape characters generally. And, but I don't know how Excel, Excel probably has some standard for handling that. F get CSV and F put CSV simply escape the character so that one creates the escapes and the other undoes them when handing you back the array. So, so long as you use functions that know about the convention, it'll work fine. Yeah? Um, I personally made the change to delimiter. Uh, yes. So there's an optional argument if we pulled up php.net where you can specify different delimiter altogether. If you're writing Etsy password files, you can change it to a colon. Wonderfully useful function. Ah, good question. If the file does not exist, because I'm using fopen, a new one would be created Unless, I'm, unless there's a gotcha with using append mode. I don't know offhand if append mode will create the file if it doesn't exist. You might have to use A plus or something like that. Other questions? All right, let's take a five minute break. All right, we're back. So CSV can get you pretty far when you want to store data, especially if it's a very simple application, right? For a 20-person faculty who orders lunch once a week, usually for an hour on Thursdays. We don't really need an actual database engine to handle this traffic. And frankly, that would just be yet more work to get things up and running. But you can imagine needing slightly more sophisticated data, like XML, so that there's some kind of structure, perhaps, or you want to include some metadata, or you just don't want to parse CSV files. You really like the semantics of using XPath or XML itself. So what I'm going to do is go back into my lunch app, lunch.php, and I, I had the foresight to implement not only csv.php, but xml.php, whose purpose in life is pretty similar in that it ultimately is still going to say one such and such for so and so coming right up. But the top of the file, I thought I'd introduce how you can not just read XML as we've been doing for project one and also this demonstration, but also write out. XML data. So let's take a quick look. So at the top, I'm doing a little sanity check again. If the user bookmarked this page or it's in their history and therefore they visited this page called XML.php, go away. Like I want you to come through the right path. So I do some sanity checks there. Notice I'm again using fopen here, but I'm using R plus mode. And I figured this out from the, the PHP.net manual page. It said if you want to read and write from the file, go ahead and spit out, uh, go ahead and use R plus. I'm going to go ahead and use my file locking mechanism. And now notice what I'm using. I'm using the fread function. 
and I'm passing in this handle. And then the second argument turns out if you want to read it all at once, you need to tell fread how many bytes are in the file. PHP comes with the kitchen sink. There's a file called file size. It tells you how many bytes that particular file is. So this already looks more complicated than the approach we've taken thus far to reading XML in, because I do need to read this file because recall, you can't append to an XML file. Why? Like you can't literally just add more lines to the bottom of it as simply as. For, so yes, <laughs> so right, you have to, this constraint that you can only have one root element, which in this case is rather annoying because it means there's that one stupid close tag at the bottom of the file that's literally stopping from me very conveniently just appending more and more orders to the file. So conceptually, I've got to somehow open this file, maybe read everything into a DOM, insert a new order, and then write the whole new structure out to disk so that I maintain this idea of well forwardness. So it's a bit more of a hurdle, but this is why, for instance, here, I couldn't just use file get contents because file get contents, which we've been using, is too useful. It does the process of opening the file, reading the contents, closing the file. But as we'll discuss a bit more next week, that makes me vulnerable to a race condition because if I'm opening a file, reading it, closing the file, and then a split second later or seconds later trying to update that file, well, it might have changed state between the time I read it in from disk and now I'm ready to update the file. In other words, I need to be able to open the file, hold on to it via a lock, read it, do some stuff, write to it, then let someone else touch it. That whole process needs to be quote unquote atomic. And to do this, I realized after some tinkering, I can't use the kitchen sink. All these nice helper functions that just do everything for you, I kind of have to do it the old fashioned way of calling fopen, calling fread, and then rewinding in the file, and then writing back out to it. And so that's the sequence of steps I took. Oh, and the reason, incidentally, is that the only locking mechanism in, built into PHP is flock, which requires that you use fopen, which also was sort of the nail in the coffin for those other more convenient functions we've used thus far. It's not much harder, but it did mean I did have to do it sort of in older, uh, an older approach. So what am I doing next? So I'm reading the contents of this file with fread, which just returns a big string in this case. I'm still passing that string to this constructor, so the end game is still the same. And now what am I doing? Well, I read the manual quickly, and it turns out it's very easy to add children to a DOM. I simply say, start at the root node and add another child called order. And the children of this order are going to be adding, added this way. The name will take this value. The item child will take this value. So in the end, we're going to get a file whose root element is something like orders, probably, though we don't see it in this case, whose children are elements of what type, according to this. So there's a root element called something. Beneath that are zero or more what? Order elements. And each of those has two children, name, an item. So I didn't really gain much here, right? I'm not storing more data. I sort of kept the amount of data I'm storing the same, but at least is a different approach. And if I now go into this order page and go back here, let's reload entirely. So I'm submitting to the right file. This time I'm going to go with the baguette. Uh, David, submit order. Okay, looks like that part worked. If I go back here now in orders.xml, is a file, it's not pretty printed because the function doesn't bother doing that for you. Computer doesn't care. But notice we do have that structure. Orders, order, name, item, and then the close tags. So let's try it once more now with someone else. So let's go back. Uh, let's say Kent will like the chicken caprese. Submit order. Let's now check orders.xml. OK, it's still ugly. But if you follow the open and closing tags, you'll see that it is well formed. And now we have two order elements, one for me and one for Kent. So now if I read this thing in and want to generate a page for the person placing the order, I can use XPath, I can use for, uh, X, the for each construct that we've seen so many times, and so forth. Now I can read this file in the same way I've been reading the menu itself. So that's pretty good. But what does this not do for us? Well, there comes a point where your traffic is just too high, whereby you don't really want to just be writing to one single file, because especially if you're locking, that means as long as it takes, you have to lock the whole file. And if it's a really big file, it's just going to take longer and longer to release that lock, which means you might have multiple users coming in, not in this application, but a real world application, all sort of waiting, um, waiting to access this file. So you don't want to do file level locking once your traffic gets bigger. So rather 
rather you'd kind of like the equivalent in the CSV world of just lock one row, like hold a place for just me and give someone else another thread a different row. You sort of want row level locking, ideally. So the only way you can get that without having to implement this wheel yourself is to use an actual database engine for which someone else already implemented those kinds of features. So an actual database engine that we'll use in this course largely because it's free and it's popular and it's very high performing is MySQL. But it implements something very similar in spirit to what Oracle does, MS Access does, SQL Server does, uh, PostgreSQL, and a bunch of other options still. But it's very easy to get up and running and again it's very popular. Certain in the commercial web hosting world, if you sign up for a web hosting account somewhere, odds are it's going to come with a whole lot of disk space, email accounts, and often an unlimited number of MySQL accounts for database access. But sometimes, too, that's a little too heavy-handed. So um, what we'll also do is, I think, come full circle and introduce something that my actual implementation of this lunch ordering website uses, which is called SQLite, which actually uses individual files, so a local file, as though it's a database. But it lets me use nice features that we're about to get with SQL, like uh, statements like select and update and delete. So if you're generally familiar with SQL commands, SQL statements, you'll find with SQLite that you can treat this individual file, a binary file, as though it's a database, even though it's just a local text file. No usernames, no passwords, no high performing database engine, but you can use the features of SQL on an actual file. And so we'll see how that's actually used. But let's introduce MySQL first and henceforth use it for the remainder of the class. So MySQL is an, oh, and I actually called MySQL once on the phone and literally asked them, do you call yourselves MySQL or MySQL? Uh, I prefer MySQL because it's faster to say marginally. Their official pronunciation is MySQL according to the representative who picked up the phone that day. So take that for what it's worth. So MySQL is an example of a relational database. So the world of relational database pretty much boils down to tables, storing your data by columns and rows, not in any kind of object-oriented or hierarchical fashion. Now, the world is gradually moving toward more sophisticated models, and various databases do support object-oriented uh, storing of objects. There are XML databases. But for better or for worse, with relational databases, the world involves tables and putting data in multiple tables, sometimes joining tables, but separating things out into rows and columns. So in that sense, if you've never used a database before, but have at least used Microsoft Excel or Google Spreadsheets, I mean, that's what we're talking about, implementing a spreadsheet, but implementing it in a slightly more sophisticated way. So what does this mean? Well, MySQL is a piece of software. You can literally go to mysql.com, click the various download links, and ultimately download a zip file or a tarball of the uh, source code even for MySQL. You can install it on your Windows box, Mac, uh, Mac box, uh, Linux box, and within minutes or hours have your own database server up and running. By convention, MySQL runs on TCP port 3306, which just means that like a web server, like a mail server, it can coexist with other things on your machine. Uh, those of you who have downloaded and installed XAMPP have actually uh, implicitly downloaded an installation of MySQL and have it up and running on your box. We on the course's web server have our own MySQL database running there. And via direct admin, will you be able to create usernames and passwords and databases, repositories of your own, within that database? At the end of the day, everything in MySQL is stored in files, so local files on the local file system. But the advantage of using an actual database engine like MySQL is that when the server starts up, it loads generally all of those files into memory, keeps them in RAM, also offers various optimizations so that unlike PHP and unlike our XML and CSV discussion just now, you're not re uh, doing uh, repeated work again and again. The database stays up and running and just ready and waiting for you to ask it queries that it, as a result, can answer quickly. So that's the value add, is that it's sitting there waiting for connections and has previously optimized itself for things like searches and sorting and insertions and so forth. But you'll get to exercise design uh, discretion over what exactly it optimizes. So this is perhaps the most underwhelming way you can introduce MySQL. There is a command line interface to it that allows you to type commands of the form select such and such from this table, delete such and such from this table, update this table, and so forth. And this, was, this is actually a very useful way of interacting with your database and was sort of the way that most people uh, did for some time. In the course, and even me personally, I prefer to use just 
GUIs that allow you to access and view the data much more easily than an 80 by 24 character window allows. And so also installed on CS75.net and also coming free with XAMPP is the software called PHP MyAdmin. Um, the fact that it's called PHP MyAdmin just means it was written in PHP, which is an utter coincidence. We use it because it's a useful GUI, not because it was written in PHP, but it was. When you log in, you'll see a screen reminiscent of this, but what's particularly powerful about PHP MyAdmin is it allows you to create tables, delete tables, edit tables, look at the rows in your tables, all via a nice web-based interface and not via a more arcane command line interface. Clicking and, and adding and changing is so much easier this way, but both approaches are actually possible. But what's wonderful too pedagogically about PHP MyAdmin is that, frankly, just by way of the various drop-downs and checkboxes and whatnot, it kind of forces forces you to realize what your options are when it comes time to add a field or create an entry. It sort of spoon feeds you the available options. So you needn't even look things up uh, nearly as frequently as you might need to in other contexts. So here comes SQL. If you want to um, start moving data, as you will for project two, into an actual database, you're going to need some way of interacting with that database. You're going to need to tell the database in advance um, what these tables look like. Right? If you were just using Microsoft Excel, you'd probably, to keep yourself sane, use the very first row to say this is the name field, this is the ID field, this is the phone number field, this is the home address field. Right? You would sort of define uh, metadata for each of your columns, and then in rows two and beyond, would you put the actual data? Well, you kind of have to do the same thing with MySQL or any relational database. You need to define your tables in advance. So you do this by way of the create statements, and you change things by way of the alter statement. You delete tables by way of the drop statement, and we'll see those in just a moment. But then, once you have this framework up and running, you sort of created a template, you need to now be able to interact with your data set. And you'll be able to select data via this uh, statement called select. Inserting data will boil down to insert, update, delete. It's all, frankly, fairly self-explanatory. The learning curve for SQL is very, very low. Certainly for the most basic of tasks, when it comes time to do more sophisticated things, kind of for project two and kind of for project three, we'll introduce things like joins and slightly more advanced topics. But frankly, it, especially with a GUI like PHP MyAdmin, it's very easy to even teach yourself some of the semantics by way of trial and error. You'll get very nice, very uh, disheartening red error message when you have a syntactical error, but it's nice for debugging. In this kind of environment, once you've got your query set, then can you go and paste it in actual PHP code knowing that you've sort of figured out the right syntax. So again, the learning curve is quite low, which is, which is nice. So um, MySQL is one particular implementation of this general query language called uh, SQL or SQL, structured query language. So you can think of, well, normally one, one tends to learn SQL before they learn XPath. And so you tend to say that XPath is to XML as SQL is to a relational database. So it's a query language that lets you get at the contents of that database or of that file. Um, so the analogy will now work in the other direction as well, hopefully. What you'll find useful, though, especially if you're using MySQL for the first time, is its documentation. It's not as user-friendly, I'd say, as PHP's, for instance, but it is the definitive source to, uh, place to go whenever you have an implementation question. So SQL defines things like select and insert, delete, create and drop. What it doesn't necessarily define are other uh, nice features like what kinds of indexes, what kinds of optimizations can you do, what kinds of data types can you have in your database. Those tend to be database specific, though thankfully Oracle and Microsoft and MySQL at least share some very large common subset typically. So the data types you'll see in just a second will generally be found in other uh, database engines as well. For instance, whoops. Oh, that was disappointing. I forgot to add that slide. Um, you will find, do I want to fix this now? I kind of, uh, no, we'll do this by way of the actual interface. So let's go ahead and do this. I'm going to go ahead and go to cs75.net slash php myadmin. You'll be redirected to the SSL secured version. It will change the capitalization slightly. I'm going to go ahead now, though, before I go there and type, uh, go to the panel, direct admin, I'm going to log in with my account. And perhaps for the first time, you soon will click this link, MySQL Management. All right, this is slightly panel specific. Normally, you would have to 
um, log into PHP MyAdmin itself, or you would log into the command line interface for MySQL and create a username, a password, then associate databases with that username and password. Direct admin kind of automates some of the uh, nuisances of doing uh, those kinds of initial setup details. I've got a few different examples here. I'm going to go ahead and create a new database by clicking this link. And all it's going to ask me is this. I need a name for the database, so we'll call this Lecture 5. Uh, the username, I don't care. I'm just going to give it lecture 5. Username, password, for now, I'll do lecture 5. Keep it all the same for simplicity. And that's it. Now it's just reporting to me that I've created a database with those characteristics. So now I should be able to log in. So let me go back over here, PHP MyAdmin, Malin lecture 5. And lecture 5 is the password. Notice I see a screen very reminiscent of the promised screenshot. And now the first place to start is at top left. Those are all of the databases that this username has access to. Just one, because I only created the one a moment ago. Let me go ahead and click that. And now you reach sort of home base, where you have the general interface for PHP MyAdmin. It's a tab-based interface where you can see the structure of your tables. You can browse the actual contents and do other stuff as well. So what should the goal here be? Well, let's start by imagining a better implementation, a higher performing implementation of this menu. What do I need to remember if I want to store um, uh, if I want to store uh, orders that people have placed for lunch, what fields? Yeah, so their names, what else? And just the item, right? I kept it pretty simple, so let's do this. So here we are at the structure tab, create a new table on this particular database. I'm going to call it orders. I could call it whatever I want. Number of fields is two. Go ahead and click Go, and now it's going to sort of give me opportunities to define these fields. All right, so what are the blanks I need to fill in? So the field name. So the first field I'm going to call name for the user's name. And here's the data types, the slide that has gone missing. So these are the available data types. For some reason, they're not alphabetized, but so be it. Um, but there's various data types that relate to dates and times and strings and numbers and Booleans and so forth. What you'll find is that some of these data types exist in other database engines, some don't. Sometimes there's aliases in one for the other. For instance, there's a Boolean data type somewhere here in the menu, but it's not actually a bool. It's actually an int that's, uh, it's actually the equivalent of an unsigned char. It's eight actual uh, bits, but you only use one of them. So that's an underlying implementation detail. But for this, I want something string-like. So there's var char, it seems, something called text, something called char. Anyone want to take a stab at what we want? Yeah, so var char is kind of the de facto default, at least for strings. It stands for variable length chars, or uh, characters. And what it allows me to do is say, you know what? Not quite sure how long a person's name is going to be. I kind of know what the upper bound is going to be. It's not going to be 1,000. It's not going to be 500. Eh, 255 tends to be a conventional max for historical reasons. But realistically, we could say a known person's name is going to be more than 64 characters, 128. So let me just go with the conventional 255. Because what's nice about varchar is that it won't use 255 bytes to store a name. It will only store as many as are necessary, but it will go up to this particular max. Now there are downsides, and once you get a little more sophisticated with SQL or MySQL specifically, or implementing higher traffic websites, then you kind of need to dig into the manual and understand, well, what does it mean to do a char 255 or a varchar 255? And what you'll find is that the trade-off in that case is that a varchar is great because it saves you space, only uses the max that it needs to to store a string, but what might be advantageous do you think about a char? Fixed length tends to be faster, because if you know where your, your boundaries are for strings, you can uh, add various optimizations, because you don't have to find the end of a string. You don't have to go searching for the equivalent of backslash 0 or the null character to find the end of the string, like you would if you were coding in something like C or C++. So there are various trade-offs between time and space and other metrics still. So varchar, though, certainly for our site is reasonable. It's not too wasteful. I don't really need something terribly high performing. So collation has all this crazy stuff. And this is sort of like character sets. Uh, don't freak out if you see that your default character set on your own computer or other servers is Swedish. Um, that just tends to be where most of the MySQL developers were from. And so the default collation tends to be Swedish. But that character set or that collation supports all of the characters and punctuation you would see in English. So it's not a big deal. But that's a common uh, FAQ uh, when it comes to this stuff. We're just going to leave it blank. When in doubt, leave it blank, see what happens. 
um, attributes. This is not your main here, but you can kind of infer from the possible values. And again, here's why this GUI is just so useful, uh, it's so instructive. Unsigned, unsigned, zero fill, on update, current timestamp. So it seems irrelevant to strings, but it does seem to be that if this were an int, I could specify here that it's an unsigned int, and therefore double the range of values I might have that are positive. All right, I'm going to leave that blank, though. Here's a drop down that lets me say, can this field be null or not? Um, so that's an important constraint, because here, do I want to let the name field be null? No, so here's where you sort of have another stopgap that you can impose. If you don't trust your own code, or you just want another measure of protection in place because conceptually it makes no sense for a record to go in the database with an empty name. Now you can imagine checking for that in PHP, but why not impose this additional constraint here so that you can also make certain assumptions in your database related code. If you know it shouldn't be null, specify that it's not null here because then if for some reason you accidentally or you write some buggy code elsewhere that tries to insert a row into the table that has a null name, the database engine itself will reject it. So it won't let it through if you've said this cannot be null. So as a result, your insert function called MySQL query is actually going to return false. It's going to trigger an error, which is good because it's yet another fail safe when it comes to keeping um, your data, um, uh, keeping your data clean. Default, here's where you can spell, specify a default value. So if we want it to be John Doe for whatever reason, we could put that there. Beware minor nuisances like when things have to be quoted, when they don't have to be quoted. That's a common sort of thing to bump into early on. That doesn't really make sense for ordering systems, so let's get rid of the default altogether. Extra only seems to be one option here, wonderfully useful. We'll talk next week about keys and maintaining a unique ID for every row in your table. If you don't want to have to figure out what's the next available int, you can let the database engine do that for you and automatically assign a user their own unique ID which we'll see next week is useful. We'll also talk next week about some of these fields. These are the primary key fields, the index field, the unique field, some additional constraints, somewhat MySQL specific, but sort of universally found in other database engines as well. So let's fill in the other blank. Name, this will be order. Order, eh, it'll be 255 characters. Again, if it's a really long order, someone with very specific tastes who needs a really specific sort of special request kind of string, not so good. It'll be truncated, but so be it for now. And we'll leave that as not null either. The last thing worth noting here is the database engine. So much like in the world of file systems, you have different file systems, NTFS, FAT32, HFS, and a whole bunch of others. In the world of databases, you have sort of an analog called database engines. My ISAM tends to be the most popular, tends to be the default for MySQL. It's very high performing, but it lacks, we'll see next week, the ability to do transactions. It does support locks, but much like with a CSV or XML file, you have to lock the whole file. Same deal with my ISAM. You have to lock the whole table if you want to uh, avoid those things called race conditions, which again we'll revisit, which tends for large data sets to not be a very efficient approach. But if you then transition to InnoDB, you'll see you uh, have the access to these things called transactions, which lets you do effectively row level locking, but you pay a performance penalty typically. So some very interesting trade-offs when you start talking about scalability, but initially going with defaults tends to be safe. So it's a good question. There is a reason for this. Like, why don't you just put um, 4 billion, right? Just let it grow as big as you would like. I think there's a subtlety that I'm forgetting offhand that probably, oh. Is, is there a length fight or a length? So there is an actual maximum. And what happens is for performance reasons, if you try to make the var, so there is a cap today on var charts. It used to be 255, hence this history here. Now it's, I think, 65,535-ish, give or take a couple. But if you exceed that, so you could make the max there. But I think you are paying somewhat of a performance uh, penalty because what I think happens with varchar is if you imagine your table really just being implemented as one big binary file whereby there are gaps in the file where data is supposed to go, there's some implication of saying, I might take up this much space, but I might not necessarily. That It has performance implications, I believe. In fact, when you cross that threshold of 65,000 characters, you have to start using the other data type called text or medium text or uh, whatever the other ones are called. And those are actually factored out of the file, stored separately, effectively by way of a pointer, also for performance reasons. I was just thinking like a thousand. Not necessarily like oh, well, then you could. <laughs> there, there, at some point, there's an implication, but I don't recall what it is. It's, 
Yeah, I mean, you could make it word size, but even to, um, it, it could be that. It could be keeping it on the word size boundary. So um, some number of a multiple four it might be advantageous. But in this case, I just don't know if there really is a big trade off. So, OK. So what can we now do with this? Let's go ahead and leave the storage engine the same. I'm going to go ahead and click Go. I don't appear to have. <laughs> I do appear to have made mistakes, but if I now click Save, it's going to ignore the empty fields. And here's where some uh, instruction can happen. So personally, we don't spend time in this course on the syntax of the create statement, only because it's fairly complicated, frankly, and it gets in the way of the interesting stuff. But literally what PHP MyAdmin did is it generated that string in this SQL query box and it executed it on the database engine. So sort of back in the day, if we were doing this in a command line environment, we would have just said, all right, folks, type create table, then specify the, ta the database name dot table name, open parenthesis, then specify all of your fields separated by commas. And the format for each field is the name of the field, the type of the field, the length of the field, special descriptors like not null, comma, repeat after this is like it just very quickly you lose sight of what's actually important which are some of the ideas which frankly I think the GUI keeps one's focus on but there will come a time where you have to write code not for our projects but in general where you might want to create tables on the fly not many of them but you could do so just by executing syntax like this now the back tick is worth noting here too if those quotes look a little askew to you it's intentional so MySQL has a special quoting character that's completely distinct from the single quote and double quote, largely so that it's very easily distinguished from what might actually appear in strings. So PHP MyAdmin by default uses backticks on almost any keyword. It's not usually necessary. You can generally just write the names of fields without any kinds of quotes around them unless they're reserved special keywords. So the word primary is actually a special keyword. You can have a field called primary, but you have to escape it by referring to it only in backticks. So MySQL takes the heavy handed, but very overly cautious approach of just quoting everything. Just realize that typically I won't, and a, a typical person won't quote everything as PHP MyAdmin has. And if you accidentally use single quotes, that's the wrong character altogether. It's backticks, which is the top left key usually near escape on your keyboard. OK, so now I have a table. There's nothing in it. If I click Browse, notice it's telling me there's nothing there. So again, for sort of development purposes or to sort of bootstrap yourself, PHP MyAdmin gives you this nice Insert tab. If I just want to very quickly get some data into the table, I can go ahead and fake an order from David for the uh, chicken salad. Salad, click Go. And now on, I'm still on the Structure tab, but notice that this is reported. I inserted one row. What was executed? Well, this syntax, with which you will get more familiar, because you will be embedding strings like this into your PHP code to execute search queries uh, and uh, delete queries and so forth. So that's the syntax there. But more on that in a moment. Now let's go to the Browse tab, and we'll see this, that I now have the, the hints at an Excel-like spreadsheet. It's a very small table. It's just got one row. But it does have some user-friendly icons. I can click this X, obviously, to delete it, this pencil to open an editor window. Again, herein lies the utility of a tool like this. And let's do one more, just to convey the idea that this is, in fact, a row. We'll do Kent. We'll just have a glass of water. I don't know why, I don't know why that's funny. <laughs> Click Browse Now, and we actually have now two rows. So this is what a relational database to be honest, is all about. It's terribly simple. There's no, idea, there's no notion of uniqueness here currently. We can have two Davids, two Kents. There is ambiguity. There's no IDs. Some of those problems we'll address next week. But let's now return to our lunch demo, whereby I want to do the following. Um, I want to go ahead now and open up, uh, let's say, do I want to do this on the fly? Yeah, we'll do that in the real one. So let me go ahead and do the following. I'm going to go back to our production version. So we'll sh in a moment, we'll, we'll conclude with a look at SQLite. But I thought now to sort of sex things up, we'd look at the real application, lest you think all of my projects are as ugly as this. Um, so the most recent version, or the final version, is this one in production. So it's a little prettier. I'm very proud of my colors and whatnot. So this actually uses, oh, I know, right? <laughs> Much prettier, right? You sort of, it's you know, a little narrow. You can nitpick over how it's implemented, but it gets, it's simple, right? And that was the goal. One stop shopping for your lunch. And there's actually neat JavaScript tricks, which I'll show. You start type, oh, look at all the faculty starting with D. So this is, oh, let's see who else, the M's. 
you too will get to do that soon if you don't know how already. <laughs> so this, this was sort of my 3 a.m. nightmare, doing something like this, click here to make your own, and I didn't want people to be able to click French baguette and choose a different sandwich here, because then it's very ambiguous. So there's very nice dynamic features of, well, if David starts to order this here, and then he chooses chicken Caesar salad. Oh, he changes his mind and starts checking here. Notice it unchecks the right one. It checks make your own. So there's lots of things behind the scenes that you can do. And we'll get to that too later in the course using little snippets of JavaScript, which are pretty much supported by all major browsers today. It doesn't take much effort. Um, so what's interesting about this example is, one, um, how we used MySQL. So let me go ahead into lunch uh, index.php, and this code is all available. I don't think I printed it just because it was particularly long for this real demo. Uh, but there's a whole bunch of stuff going up at the top um, that I sort of took baby steps toward implementing this. Frankly, the first iteration of the program was pretty much as simple as the very first sort of uh, sandbox examples we did. And then so once I realized what the layout was that I wanted, once I realized how I wanted to enumerate the various categories and the various items, I decided I needed some additional data structures like some arrays containing all the spreads for various reasons that sort of I came across while implementing. Um, notice too that um, the menu wasn't necessarily sorted. I decided that Rebecca's Cafe hadn't taken the time to sort the menu. Mildly annoying, but I also wanted to make it easy to maintain the thing. So I literally um, made the XML file by hand following the same structure of the file because I figured, eh, in code I can sort the whole thing automatically. So I'll, you'll see if you poke around at home some neat uses of functions like UK sort, user key sort, where you can actually specify a function that you want to apply to all of the strings before they're actually compared for equality or less than or equal than. So again, PHP has some really nice tricks for that. So ignore some of the complexity for now, but notice at least this little takeaway from project one. It's the same exact idea, just with a little more fanciness. Um, but here's where things get interesting. I'm actually using SQL, but I'm using not MySQL in this particular example, but I'm actually using SQLite. It felt very heavy handed and just a lot more work to make sure a database is up and running and to create a username and a password just for an app that, again, is going to get used once a week by 20 people. Felt like overkill to have an actual dedicated database server. But I really like the idea of using this new SQL syntax, like select all of the distinct names and items and requests, special requests, from a table called orders and order those results, order the rows being returned by their date in ascending order. So this is more keywords than we introduced in that slide a moment ago. But I just really like the expressiveness of SQL because I gained so much more with that one line of SQL code than I did certainly calling f get CSV or file get contents, which just returns the string, or even the XML constructor. I can specify a very a more sophisticated search query. But now, what was the goal here? Well, I wanted to allow, um, I wanted to get. Um, unique names back and their respective items. And I knew the names would be unique because I made the array of possible faculty members. And I wanted to get them from that orders table. I wanted them pre-sorted. So again, I can do all of this in the database engine. So that's something, too, you get when you move from flat files to actual databases. They can perform more code-like features for you, more logic for you, like sorting and searching in this particular case. Now, what am I getting back? Well, nicely enough, what you get back by executing a SQL query is an array in PHP. And it's an associative array, aka hash table, whereby the keys inside that array are the field name, and the values are whatever were in those cells in the database. So what am I doing here? I'm calling this function called query. I'm passing in this SQL statement. And I'm iterating over each of the returned rows, one at a time, calling each row. So to be clear, what this has returned effectively is this stuff that I just highlighted. When I call query, I'm getting an array, each of whose elements is one row followed by another row followed by another from that table. So I can use my familiar for each construct. What do I want to do? Well, I want to grab the person's name. I want to call stir to lower on it, and just because for reasons that will become clear later. And I want to grab from that row array the field called name. Next, and now. Next, I want to wave my hands at these details because they have to do with the fancy JavaScript autocomplete and I needed default values for some things. Um, notice that this whole 
block of code is encapsulated in a try catch block. So this is too something that if you've not seen this syntax before, when it comes up in examples or projects, just sort of take it um, for what it's worth. And we'll spend less time explaining it in this course only because many of you, most of you have probably seen this approach before. What I'm using here is a particular library, the PDO library, um, that allows me that rather than printing errors to the screen or returning values like false, it will quote unquote throw an exception when something bad happens to signify an actual error. So Java has this feature, uh, JavaScript has this feature, C++, C Sharp, and a bunch of languages have this feature. So for now, let me wave my hand at some of these details. But the point for, that, for this particular example is that with this one line of code, the SQL code, am I able to get back precisely the rows that I want? So in fact, let's try this. Let me go ahead and copy this. And it's a little more complicated than we even need just yet. But let me go over to my SQL tab. Oh, here too is it useful to just paste in your queries to try them out. So let me copy this, paste this in. And if there's no syntactic errors, which there are, oh, right, I'm using the wrong database. So what's wrong here? Unknown column item in field list. So that kind of makes sense. So let's try to reverse engineer what I really want. So what I really want is, let's keep it simple, select name, order from orders, and I tend to be anal and always put my SQL statements in caps and any field names and table names in lowercase just helps me visually parse things and it's a pretty common convention. That's going, damn it, order from, oh, did I have something there? Oh, sorry. Oh, interesting. Did I call the field order? Yeah, so that's why I called it item in the real implementation. Okay, so. Select name backtick order from, that's actually a perfect demonstration of why we just talked about that. Orders is probably okay. And I'm not going to do any kind of filtration. And there we go. Now I get back the results. Now you can do, and we'll just hint at some of these details this week rather than go over all of them in great detail, where I only want Kent's order. So where name equals quote unquote Kent. And now I get back just Kent's row. If I want to be, I'm a little unsure who I want, where the name starts with K something, so percent sign means whatever else, sort of like the, oh, yes, not, where name like K star or K percent sign in this case, we get back the same thing, all names starting with K. So again, just meant, meaning to hint at these features tonight, but some of the more interesting things you can do. So now let's go back to our own example here in our development directory and open up SQLite.php and really just focus in on what it took to get this particular job done. Again, I backpedaled for this application because I didn't really need a whole database engine to actually uh, store this information, but the syntax is almost identical, certainly for the SQL part. So again, I have this sanity check at the top of this file. This is sqlite.php. This is just meant to swap out csv.php or xml.php. And I'm going to try to do the following, some of whose lines could throw an exception, so to speak. So I've put them in this try block. And if something goes wrong, I'm just going to die. Die is a sort of very heavy-handed approach to just terminating the connection, spitting out an error code, not the right way, quote unquote, to respond to a problem, but for lecture purposes, it just spits to the screen what the problem is, which is useful. So this is one of those things where initially, it's a copy-paste job. Like if you want to use this library, the PDO, I think it's Portable Data Objects Library, that allows you to use the SQL Lite features of PHP, you kind of use those two lines of code. Now, the first one's important. You specify a new object, PDO object. SQLite is the driver to use. We could use MySQL colon, but there's easier ways. Then the name of the file you want to use. So there is literally a file in the current working directory called orders.db, but I could have called it foo. Doesn't matter what I call it. These attributes are just necessary for actually how I want to handle errors ultimately. So again, sort of copied and pasted from the manual, but the rest is all very uh, familiar, or at least um, similar to what we've been discussing. I'm going to prepare these fields. So it turns out, and we'll talk about this when we talk about security, you want to ward off things like SQL injection attacks. So this is all too common, whereby if a website is taking input from a user and then inserting that data, like a registration data, directly into their database, Bad things can happen if the user is malicious and instead of providing David as the string, instead put something like a close quote, a space, and a keyword like delete from table name, 
or something that they kind of know if it's executed raw, bad things will happen. Well, we'll show an example in a week or two of how easy this is to do unless you quote unquote escape user provided data. Using this PDO library, the function to call quite simply is quote. So pretty much what it does is it converts any single quotes or double quotes to backslash single quote, backslash double quote to ward off these, the kinds of tricks that we'll see are so easy to implement. So this is just a safety mechanism here. I'm quoting these two fields and then I'm execing. So sometimes you use query, sometimes you use exec depending on the type of SQL statement you're using with SQLite. I'm executing the following. Insert into orders these two fields with these two values. So this is the general syntax for inserting a row into a database when you don't have this nice sort of client-side GUI like PHP MyAdmin and you actually need to do it programmatically. So that's all it takes to insert a row into the database and then if something bad happens, we'll actually trigger this message. Now does this actually work? Well, let's see. Let me open up lunch.php, change XML to uh, SQLite. Dot PHP. Now the one catch is I have to have pre-made the database, right? So I can't start writing to a database table called orders unless I've made that table in advance. Now I could have added to the top of this file a SQL statement that starts with what keyword? Little pop quiz. No, create, right? So I alluded to it earlier. There's this create table syntax, it turns out, that lets you create a table. Why does it probably not make sense to put it at the top of this file though? Right, you don't want to create a table every time. You want to do it once, sort of as you're prepping yourself for this application. So you can do that at the command line. You can write a one line script to actually do it once, but it probably doesn't belong in this code. Um, but what does exist is this command called SQLite 3. It's the third version of it. And it's very similar in spirit to the MySQL command we'll look at next week, which gives you access to an actual MySQL database. I've got a file called lunch.db already. I get this very underwhelming prompt. There's a command called dump, which shows me what's inside of this database. And currently, there's nothing. All right, so I haven't actually created the table. Now, how do I go about creating the table? Did I give us our file? No. Um, so what was the syntax for creating a table? Create table. Yep, so orders. Parenthesis. Name, was it var char 255 not null? Oh, yes, var car 255 not null comma order. Oh, I don't, let's see. I think it's probably going to want, call it Item? No, we called it order, didn't we? All right, so I'm not sure if it'll like these quotes, but order, var char 255, not null, semicolon, uh, close parenthesis. Okay, why is it waiting? Wants a semicolon. Another stupid thing to strip over early on. Ooh, that was actually a nice sigh of relief. Worked. Okay, so when I dump it, what it's actually dumping is not sort of the visual tabular structure, but rather the sequence of commands that created the current state of this database. So the first one is create. Once I start inserting things, if I dump the database again, I'll see a lot of insert statements. So it's sort of like a, tra a running log of what's been executed on the database, but in a sense it tells you what's in it at least that particular command. All right, so I've changed lunch.php to point to sqlite.php. Let's take a look if the demo is going to get the job done. So let me go back to our development version, reload. Let me insert David, Mediterranean chicken, submit order. OK, HTML seems to suggest nothing went wrong. And that's also a good sign because the, the thing didn't die, literally. So there's no error message being printed. So let me go back to the command line, run SQLite 3. Uh, oops, SQLite 3 of lunch.db. And now dump. And damn it. <laughs> Something else went wrong. Order. Ah, this is why I meant to create the table in advance. SQLite.php, orders.db. Oh. That's why it wasn't there. You let me call it a different name altogether. All right, a good learning exercise nonetheless. Uh, SQLite orders.db, dump this table. Whew, there it is. OK. So we created, I thought I had pre created the database, but it's OK. We recreated it in a different file altogether, but I was meaning to use orders.db. And there it is. So it's not pretty, at least, but we've just dumped the, the statements that have gotten us to this particular state of the world. So if I now wanted to get at this data, I'm going to have to do something like select from the table name, and I could iterate over it, much like I did in the actual application example. But um, thus far, 
let's see, did I include this? VI orders, orders.xml. Yeah, that I think we can leave for a follow-up exercise. So any questions on this? Uh, yeah. Oh, that's a good question. So we will see many more examples of this next week, but in, where did I have it? SQLite.php? Uh, sprintf. Oh, did I have it in the production version? So using sprintf in PHP is a popular way of substituting in variables because you can use the percent %s uh, trick that you would find in printf and, and other functions like that. It's not necessary here, but I typically use it anyway so that I can very easily insert placeholders. So we'll see more examples of that next time, but it facilitates inserting variables dynamically into a file. So before then, just one teaser then as to what else there is. So I alluded to some other icons in PHP my admins uh, table. We didn't actually insert unique IDs for this particular database of menu orders, but we'll be able to add unique numbers that allow us to merge tables on the fly so as to keep uh, similar data together but in separate tables and also to find data more quickly because we can tell the database in advance, which you can't tell an XML file or CSV file, create a very nice B tree or some other sophisticated data structure that facilitates finding names quickly or finding numbers quickly or finding any field particularly quickly. And the example we'll begin with, I think, next time is this authentication module. Recall that the website has something very similar to this, and we looked at four different variants of the notion of logging into a website, all of which use the very lame implementation of a constant for jharvard and password crimson. Finally, now that we have this expressiveness for an actual database, whatever format it's stored in, can we actually create real usernames and passwords that can be created on the fly, that can be queried on the fly, that will make this much more uh, reflective of the actual login mechanism we're using and that you yourselves we'll use for project two. So with that said, uh, section will begin in a few minutes across the hall and we will see you next week.